My name is Jeroen Hugenholz. I am from uh, Wageningen University and Research, and I actually represent one of the research institutes. So they, that's an applied research institute doing contract research uh, at the location uh, of the campus of the University of Wageningen. And I will be talking to you about how we look at fermentation in general, where we get our inspiration and how uh, we uh, approach the topic of microbial proteins and also microbial biomass uh, as a concept. So when we look at um, uh, fermentation, uh, this is uh, how we represent this. Uh, in the center, we see this uh, oval yellow uh, egg, uh, and this uh, represents a microorganism. And we see it as a cell factory where sugar or let's say mixed biomass or even gas, syngas, can be converted by this cell factory into uh, organic acids, alcohols, uh, other uh, fermentation products and in the meantime very various other things happen as a result of this fermentation that means that biomass is formed so instead of uh, one uh, organism you will get uh, millions or trillions of these uh, organisms and uh, within this biomass uh, within this process several things happen uh, there will be uh, uh, an increase in preservation of the original material that is being fermented. There will be vitamins formed in many cases. There will be oils uh, and fatty acids formed in some cases. There will always be protein formed, which is almost 50 or even more, uh, a larger part of the total biomass and several other things uh, that I will not uh, go over in this uh, presentation can also happen, like uh, production of solvents, uh, flavors, fragrances, etc. But I will give an, a, a few examples shown here on uh, preservation, on vitamins, on oils, fatty acids, and on protein. So the way that we get inspired, uh, this is not completely sharp, this, but this is the periodic table of fermentation. So this represents, let's say, all uh, existing fermented products in the world. Uh, and these fermented products have been uh, characterized in some cases in very much detail. And we know the organisms that are involved. We know the specific conversions that take place uh, by these organisms, the specific products that are being formed. And ac actually based on this type of knowledge coming from everywhere in the world, we base our novel fermentation processes uh, if we are looking for certain functionality that, one, uh, that is going to be formed or for the certain substrates that we want to convert. This is all based on existing knowledge somewhere out there in the world. Um, well, the uh, uh, fermentation is, uh, let's say, a traditional process uh, that is well known in the food industry uh, and is used actually for uh, a preservation uh, of uh, perishable food products. So these food products uh, will spoil uh, quickly all kind of undesirable, sometimes pathogenic microorganisms will start to grow and then you will have food that is not healthy uh, to consume anymore. But traditionally, fermentation has been used uh, to uh, avoid this problem. And then the uh, organisms are used that are actually uh, safe and organisms will convert the product into something which is nice and also has a long shelf life. Uh, traditionally, this was done by uh, organic acids being formed like lactic acid or acetic acid or alcohols, ethanol, uh, leading to longer shelf life. But nowadays we also have identified uh, also more specific antimicrobials like uh, compounds that uh, act against fungi. And fungi are still a major problem in the food industry and we have seen now examples of so-called protective cultures that can be used to protect the uh, perishable food against fungal spoilage. The type of compounds that are uh, formed besides the organic acids or besides the uh, alcohols, which I already described, are 
things like cyclic peptides that are specifically acting against fungi or phenyl lactic acid or phenyl acid acetic acid which is a uh, derivative of phenyl alanine conversion but also uh, various uh, antifungal proteins and enzymes and also uh, uh, other organic acids like propionic acid or specific aldehydes like the reuterine uh, that can be produced as a result of a specific fermentation process and not all organisms do this only very uh, specific ones that have been isolated for such antifungal uh, uh, activity. Well, um, uh, these uh, antifungal cultures are currently already used, especially in the dairy industry. They are quite well known to predict against uh, fungal or yeast spoilage of various uh, dairy products. But uh, we have shown that you can also use it in other applications, for instance, in uh, conserving uh, fruit juice. And we see here examples where we added some of this ferments, uh, these protective cultures to pear juice and strawberry juice. And we see that there are no fungi growing in some of the uh, trials. And we uh, you can actually also use that uh, to uh, protect fresh fruit like strawberries against fungal spoilage. And we see here examples where we have tested different of these uh, cultures and then in the middle there are a few that worked very well against the fungi that were flying around in this case in our laboratory uh, situation. Well there's a there's a large interest in this because uh, currently for uh, keeping a fr uh, for for longer shelf life of fresh fruit there are all kind of chemicals being used and many of these chemicals are actually not allowed anymore and, and people are looking for alternatives. Well, um, since this is not about preservation, uh, this works but about microbial proteins and biomass. One of the things that is associated also with biomass uh, of my microbes is, uh, is B vitamins. Many of the B vitamins uh, are accumulated in this biomass and can be an, a valuable source also in fermented foods. Uh, and we know of uh, different uh, food grade microorganisms that are used, uh, for instance, in the dairy industry again, uh, as Lactococcus lactis and Streptococcus thermophilus, that they produce folate, and some of them also produce riboflavin. We know of propioni bacteria and Lactobacillus aureuteri that they produce vitamin B12, and also of some of these bacteria that produce vitamin K. And actually, you see some of them appearing uh, at uh, every vitamin that I mentioned here. So we can actually get multivitamin enrichment using specific selected microorganisms. And this is also uh, can be applied, for instance, for enriching a product like yogurt by fermentation, by the addition of lactobacillus aureuteri. You can get uh, an enrichment in vitamin B12, and this is very relevant, of course, because uh, these micrograms are actually the, your actual daily requirement for this vitamin. Even more interesting, if if you look at the at the fruit juice or a, a vegetable or plant-based product, uh, which is uh, where vitamin B12 is naturally absent, and if you use this process of you of this uh, adding this microorganism, you will get an enrichment in, with vitamin B12. And this can be very relevant for, uh, for instance, vegetarian and vegan uh, population. Um, another um, topic uh, also related to microbial biomass is production of oils. Um, we know of uh, various uh, yeast, especially, but also microalgae, that they produce naturally oils. Uh, they accumulate that uh, inside uh, their uh, cytoplasm. Uh, and uh, you see that actually already appearing when you plate these on agar plates, these organisms, you get very oily colonies. Well, these oils uh, are actually very similar in composition as, uh, for instance, palm oil or sunflower oil. And we see this as a possibility to uh, produce under uh, using fermentation alternatives to, uh, to palm oil ingredients. Well, the organisms, uh, uh, this is one of the best 
producing uh, oil producing microorganism. It's a yeast called Cryptococcus cavatus. And when you look under the microscope and you zoom in, you see these oil droplets uh, lighting up inside uh, these yeast cells. And you can isolate, you can grow them and you can isolate it and you get something that looks uh, very much like a, a vegetable oil. Um, so uh, to uh, make this into uh, uh, an, uh, let's say a sustainable and also uh, affordable process, uh, we see that um, we need uh, to develop processes based on uh, cheap uh, uh, substrates, which are waste or side streams from the agri-food industry. Some of those side streams have very little cost on the market. And if you use them as a substrate for your uh, yeast fermentation, you can get uh, an affordable process and you can get actually a cost price, which is very similar to current cost price of vegetable oils. Well, the different platforms that we work on is this Cryptococcus and Yarovia. Those are both uh, oil accumulating yeast. We have microalgae that also accumulate uh, oils, but with a very specific composition. Uh, they are more uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, as a, uh, a valuable substrate in, uh, for instance, uh, baby uh, food. But we also see very similar processes happening, uh, uh, and this is not for food application, but production of uh, polymers based on hydroxy fatty acids uh, called PHA. This is a plastic uh, uh, type of uh, component, which is uh, produced by various different bacteria. And uh, the work that we are concentrating on currently is to uh, make this an uh, affordable process on uh, various uh, side streams, but also to see if we can actually change the composition at will so that we can uh, modify the chain length of the fatty acids or the saturation level of the fatty acids. The application of these oils is, of course, as uh, 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 in um, uh, as an uh, alternative to vegetable oils, uh, for instance, in mayonnaise, but also uh, the fatty acids that are isolated from the oils uh, can have a specific antifungal protection, so it's a good preservative. I al already mentioned that this, these hydroxy fatty acids, uh, the polymers, uh, can be used as plastics, but we, you can also use them as surfactants or emulsifiers, or you can convert them into fatty alcohols with different uh, cosmetic applications. And I al already mentioned the polyunsaturated fatty acids that are used in food and feed. Now, the uh, let's say the uh, final topic, and I spend a little bit more time on that, is the production of microbial protein, so that uh, we see fermentation as a good alternative source for production of protein, uh, for instance, as uh, 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 to be applied in feed, uh, but also to uh, be applied uh, as a meat or dairy alternative. And here we base ourselves on already known uh, examples uh, on the market, like corn, which is based on the fungus Fusarium veninatum. It's pure biomass from this uh, fungus. And this is already on the, uh, on the market for many, many years. Uh, we know from uh, the uh, uh, Far East uh, uh, of uh, products like natto, which is uh, a fermented uh, product uh, based on Bacillus subtilis, and it consists actually mainly of Bacillus subtilis biomass. And we know, of course, tempeh, which is uh, it's a solid state fermentation of soybean uh, using uh, the organism Rhizopus oligosporus. And uh, this is uh, also massively consumed uh, by large parts of the uh, population in the world. Well, based on these examples, we know, of course, uh, uh, the type of organisms uh, that are uh, uh, available and possible and where you can actually produce a functional and consumable protein. And um, what we uh, set out to do at this point is to see uh, if there are even more possibilities there. And one of the things that we focus on currently is to look at existing microbial biomass from, uh, let's say, chemical processes uh, or 
biochemical processes like uh, ethanol production and organic acid production where uh, for ethanol of course uh, huge amounts of yeast are being used for organic acids like citric and lactic and acetic acid we have different organisms like aspergillus and bacillus and gluconobacter being used massively uh, and, and where the microbial biomass is mainly a waste product and this uh, uh, represents a, a huge source of protein uh, uh, all over the world. We also look at, um, uh, let's say, the examples that we already know from tempeh, for instance, where rice opus is used for solid state fermentation. This process can be used for many other type of uh, uh, agri-food crops, like lupine and chickpea and clover and various cereals. And this is being employed now uh, 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 at various places in the world. And uh, this yields, of course, very interesting new products where microbial protein is actually the main source of nitrogen uh, in the final product. And uh, what we do, of course, with these new products and also with this existing microbial biomass that we want to apply in food or feed is look at digestibility, look at amino acid composition and compare that with the uh, already existing sources of this protein. And also look at uh, different uh, 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 model systems to look at uh, animal response. Uh, for instance, the zebra fish response is something that we have uh, at our facility where motility, but also the microbiota composition of the zebra fish and intestinal integrity is uh, a measure for how toxic or how uh, good the uh, protein source uh, can eventually be for uh, application in food or feed. Well, if you look at, for instance, this existing protein source that I mentioned for these organic acids, for bioethanol, for vitamin C, we're dealing here with massive amounts of, uh, of uh, protein uh, that is available and that is now currently not used or underutilized as potential uh, protein source. You see that bioethanol, that an estimation, uh, it's my estimation, is that we are dealing here with 10 to the 10th or maybe even 10 to the 11th kilogram uh, production of this yeast protein per year. And also for citric acid, we get fungal protein 10 to the 9th kilograms, acetic acid 10 to the 10th kilogram of bacterial protein. This is all potentially very useful and interesting protein, which could be uh, used in the food and feed industry. Other sources of microbial biomass that we are thinking about uh, is uh, applying these organisms that are traditionally known uh, to produce relatively high amounts of uh, microbial biomass and thus also microbial protein, like Pichia pastoris, which is the classical single cell protein process. Uh, uh, organism uh, which uh, is also uh, able to convert uh, uh, abundant substrates like methanol uh, into a microbial protein. Bacillus subtilis is very well known for uh, heterologous protein uh, production but it is a very good uh, organism that shows very high uh, yields of biomass on various substrates so this is potentially a very interesting uh, um, cell factory for natural proteins. And we see Yaroia, which I mentioned before, uh, for as a good producer of oils. Well, one thing it also produces is protein. And actually, combination of oil and protein together uh, can be a very interesting combination for finding alternatives for meat or uh, dairy uh, products, uh, but then based on microbial biomass. And also some bacteria like cyanobacteria uh, can be besides uh, can be of course produce protein, but they are uh, besides that interesting uh, for uh, for co-production of things like vitamins, pigments, and flavors. So uh, one of the uh, interesting issues uh, uh, when you are producing microbial protein is that uh, we're dealing here mostly with aerobic fermentation, so you need to do uh, uh, sparging uh, with oxygen, pure oxygen, or with air. You need to stir. And uh, one, one thing, uh, some organisms show massive amounts of foaming. This is an example here 
where actually the foam was uh, uh, really uh, uh, polluting uh, the whole uh, fermentation uh, equipment. And this is an example of ammoniella, which is a yeast which is well known for production of erythritol. And uh, th this needs to be solved if you want to uh, scale up this process and get some uh, reasonable uh, production process and easy, uh, something that is easy to handle. Um, here's examples of uh, some of the things that we do with this microbial protein. And this is just, uh, let's say, very exploratory work where we look at how can you use this material, for instance, in a food application. And here we see examples where we used uh, Yarovia biomass. So this is not a protein or oil that has been ex extracted, but it's pure biomass. And we look at how it behaves, in, for instance, in 3D printing. And then you see that if you add nothing, it, it, it has uh, too little structure. But if you uh, add, for instance, some starch or some tan, uh, you can get actually very nice structures formed based on this microbial biomass. Something else that we have uh, been testing is to look at this type of material and see how it behaves in baking. So can you use it, for instance, as a flour? And then we can see that we can make something that looks like pancakes or uh, other types of cakes uh, based on also in some case with or without ingredients and then you will see uh, various results coming out of, uh, of these uh, uh, processes and we plan to do that with uh, many more uh, of these bacterial or microbial uh, biomass sources and see which one behaves best. So uh, I would like to uh, give you uh, at, at, the, at the end of my presentation a feeling of how we look at this fermentation and how people call this precision fermentation and, and what we actually uh, mean by that. Um, so what we mean by precision fermentation is that we use actually selected microorganisms uh, and these are selected for production of specific uh, functionalities like protein or like flavors or like preservation or like vitamins and we use controlled conditions that are optimized for production of these specific components and uh, precision fermentation also uh, represents a selected uh, substrate for this fermentation and we are uh, mostly focusing on low cost uh, waste streams because that makes the fermentation process affordable. Municipal solid waste is a process that we have been uh, studying, especially for the production of these uh, organic, uh, these fatty acids and these oils, and also for the bioplastics. But we also have, for instance, different waste streams from the sugar refinery, and we have refused crops uh, from. Uh, our uh, local uh, production of uh, cabbage and uh, peppers and tomatoes. We have seaweed, we've tested seaweed uh, that is in some uh, parts of the world uh, accumulating on the beaches like sargassum. Spent barley, potato peels and sugar beet leaves is a very uh, typically Dutch uh, um, uh, waste stream from the agri-food industry. We have uh, looked at the waste streams from the bioethanol production and from the brewery industry and uh, citrus peels, grape pomace, and also animal uh, feed like chicken feathers and also mushroom uh, waste streams uh, are, have been tested for various applications. And the way that you uh, handle this is that you, uh, of course, need equipment in your lab and also in your pilot plant process and uh, make uh, these crops into something that is fermentable. So you have to uh, cut them, you have to blend them, uh, uh, mix them in such a way that a fermentation is possible. And then uh, you, of course, need to think about things like, uh, do we, what kind of treatment do we give this uh, kind of substrate? We can use uh, mild heating because you want to inactivate some of the microorganisms, but you don't want to uh, basically kill or uh, um, change your substrate so that it is not desirable anymore. Uh, so you need to limit that. And in some cases, we do fermentations with fresh substrates without doing any kind of heat treatment. 
Then you deal with, uh, let's say, the initial load of microorganisms. And here we see examples where you see that an initial uh, waste stream contains 10 to the 6 or even 10 to the 7th uh, per milliliter or per gram of uh, microorganisms. And then you use different kind of heat treatment to uh, uh, reduce that. Uh, but uh, it's very difficult uh, to reduce it to zero uh, without destroying your material completely. So um, all these kind of uh, approaches uh, Basically, it can be uh, summarized uh, also in a technical economic evaluation. And we see that here we have examples where we turn a waste stream into something valuable using, for instance, a yeast fermentation producing microbial protein or yeast protein or a component like erythritol using this moniella or uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids using a, using a microalgae. And one of the things that uh, struck us in this kind of studies is that uh, if you l concentrate on only one benefit or one compound coming out of this microbial biomass, like only protein or only oils, you will not get a good business case. But if you look at co-production, for instance, you take a look at the erythritol being formed and the microbial protein from Moniella, you can get a very interesting business case based on your fermentation process. So how does this fermentation look like? Well, here are some pictures uh, from our laboratory, but you can find this in many places in the world where you can actually use fermentation at uh, uh, values below, uh, uh, volumes below the one milliliter to up to 2000 liter scale. Uh, and uh, the smaller uh, your volume, the more uh, uh, you can do at the same time, uh, uh, so in parallel, and, uh, the, and as soon as you can uh, uh, focus on a specific example which is successful, then you move into the higher volumes. So in summary, uh, I would like to uh, uh, tell you that, of course, fer fermentation is that we know is traditionally used for protection against spoilage, but many of the attributes of fermentation are based on uh, existing fermentation processes around the world. We can be, and they can be used for vitamin enrichment, for to generate natural oils and fatty acids and plastics, and of course, uh, microbial protein by various uh, types of microorganism. And precision fermentation involves selected microorganisms and controlled fermentation com conditions, and actually, uh, precision fermentation can be done to a low, uh, as low volume as 200 microliters up to 4,000 liter scales. And uh, efficient fermentation on waste side streams needs a, a good selection of strains. So you need to test a lot of different conditions. But you can also uh, choose for cultures and adapt them to specific uh, types of waste streams. And then viable business cases for side stream biomass fermentations uh, usually require co-production of more than one product ingredient. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.